Okay, we're good. we're live. Okay, April second, twenty nineteen, at six oh five. Work session has now begun. First item on the work session agenda is to discuss the uh, proposed code changes, and we have perhaps a report from staff. Yes. Um, so. We haven't heard this item before. And sorry, Claire, I think we'll get to the open house. Oh, that's uh, fine. That's um, fine. I don't know exactly how many people came. But um, uh, so first, we're talking about the code amendments. Um, this process has been going on for a long time. The city received a grant of $100,000 from Metro um, a year or two ago to uh, perform a code audit um, and an update of our code to remove and reduce barriers to housing development in the city. And so that was a, we formed a public advisory group and had this very long process to uh, identify all the ways that our Oregon City's code maybe um, throws barriers out um, to affordable housing and housing in general. Um, and we, uh, put together a package of code amendments to try and um, fix that, streamline our code, allow more flexibility, um, relax some of the design standards um, citywide for housing. And uh, the, the code amendments, um, be, w when the city do does a change um, to our municipal code um, and it involves zoning, we have to send out a citywide notice. Um, so everyone actually received a postcard probably last, last year when the hearing, before the hearing started. Um, and it's expensive to do that. So if we're gonna do it, then sometimes we like to tack on um, additional uh, code changes that we've uh, been needing or wanting to do. Um, to go with the, that, so the code amendment package that the city commission and the planning commission have been reviewing uh, is mostly to do with housing, but also has some um, general cleanup items and a few other kind of changes that just needed to be made um, and have nothing to do with housing. So um, one of those kind of updates or cleanup items is to chapter 2.28 historic review board, um, kind of our, the, the procedures and um, administrative provisions uh, for the board. And that, uh, so I attached that chapter with the red lines or the um, cross outs and underlines um, to the agenda and um, a lot of, all of our procedures generally, including appeals and, and all that, are all um, concentrated in one chapter, chapter 1750. Um, and so the major removal um, of that section in chapter 2.28 is just a repetitive kind of redundant section at this point. Um, and so we don't need it anymore in our, um, in our chapter, 2.28. Um, the part of it that's a little bit um, nuanced is that nowhere else in our code does, um, do we have a fee amount? So, um, you know, we have fees for all of our different land use applications and none of those are codified. Um, we just have a fee schedule that's adopted by resolution and then that, that goes up um, every um, every year, generally, those fees increase every year based on the consumer price index. Um, hmm. Only the historic review fee is is, is um, codified, or the historic review app appeal fee. Um, so, in order to be consistent uh, with that, with the rest of our code, we would remove that. And um, it would only be on that fee sheet. Um, now, the historic review appeal fee and the application fee of, of $50, um, those actually don't go up every year by the consumer price index. Those are set at $50. Um, and if the city ever uh, wanted to consider changing those fees, um, 
we understand that it would be through a public process and the board would be involved um, and we wouldn't simply make a change to the fee schedule or, and then have it go to the city commission for adoption by resolution. So I wanted to clarify that because that was kind of a, um, a concern um, that we heard that, you know, now, now that you have that fee not in the code, um, you uncodify it, then, you know, you can increase it, for example. But we have no plans to increase any fees at this point. And if we do, it'll come to you and we'll discuss it with the public as well. Um, did you have any questions about the um, any of the other updates or the changes to that chapter? Nope. I didn't. Okay. Um, so the other the other part of the code amendments um, that actually uh, have to do with housing. Um, they they do affect McLaughlin and Kanema because uh, the, you know zoning in those neighborhoods includes a lot of residential zoning and zoning where housing is permitted, of course. And um, some of the changes in the, this that, that are being proposed in this set of code amendments include uh, allowing internal conversions of existing structures. I think right now the um, the draft code says that any structure. 20 years, um, that's at least 20 years old, um, is eligible for a com internal conversion. I think this commission is c considering changing that, like maybe making it apply to any structure. Um, but right now, the way it's written, it, the structure has to be 20 years old. Um, and I think that's to keep, you know, new newer subdivisions from being built and then everything gets internally converted immediately. I, I, so we'll see where that goes. But um, uh, so, but for our purposes, you know, most of these homes in these neighborhoods are older than 20 years old anyway. And so they would all be eligible for internal conversions. Um, that the number of units uh, that you can convert the home into um, can go up to four and it's based on the square footage of the property. So if it's a larger property, you when might- When you say the square footage of the property, you're talking the structure. No. You're talking the lot. lot. The lot, yeah. It's lot coverage percentage. R right, so if you have a, um, a 10,000 square foot property, um, you might lot. be able to have four units. Uh, if you have a 5,000 square foot property, property, you might only be able to internally convert your home into two units, which would be a duplex. Um, I don't, uh, we can look up the exact uh, numbers, um, but I, the maximum is four. Um, and then what we know about building code is that uh, built, a different building code is triggered when you have a three or more units in one building. Um, and, and that adds a lot of expense to these internal conversion projects. So what we would probably see more of is conversion to duplexes um, because that doesn't trigger any um, building code that's different from a single family building code. Um, so they'd still be subject to building codes. Be subject to building code and be subject to historic review. So if someone, if you had a designated structure um, somebody wants to convert it, a single family home, we want to convert it into a duplex, um, and it involves adding a front door, adding another door or entry. Um, if it is uh, just, just a door um, and it meets the historic review board policies, then I could approve it as staff. If it adds any square footage at all, uh, then it would come to the board for review. So, so the these code amendments that allow these conversions, they don't change um, the applicability of the historic um, chapter. Um, the other uh, allowance that's proposed is to allow corner duplexes um, in all, like throughout the city, in all of our single family zones. So um, any 
uh, any corner property could develop as a duplex with an entrance like on each corner side. When you, <clears throat> when you say throughout the city, you're including McLaughlin and mm -hmm. Nima. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be permitted. Of course, it would still, like, let's say we have a vacant lot or, you know, there's a teardown or something um, in McLaughlin or Kanema, and then it's a corner lot and they want to build a duplex. That still comes to the board for review and, and the same standard, same guidelines apply. I just had a, can I ask mm -hmm. just any question? Like, when I read the ADU stuff, yeah. and I'd asked before if there was a couple things. And one of them they're keeping is retain owner occupancy requirement, mm -hmm. which I, um, and then uh, the allowable size from 40 to 60% of the gross floor area of the primary or 800 feet. Mm -hmm. Is 800 feet the max? Yes. Yeah. 800 square feet. Um, that's currently the max. So we wouldn't be changing the maximum, but we would be. For some reason I thought, yeah, I thought it was going to go up. No. Like increase in size. Um, so if you have a thousand square foot house and you want to build an ADU right now, you can only build 600 ADU, square uh, 400. feet. Right now you can only build 400 square foot oh, ADU. So 600 is what so, it so could be. Yeah. It, but if you have a larger home, like a 2000 square foot home, then 800 is your max. I just have a hard time with the owner occupancy requirement. Um, the city commission has a lit, a long list of items that they've flagged for additional conversation, um, and that's one of them, I believe. So on uh, tomorrow, actually, is um, the, the next hearing, and then the hearing after that, I guess the second one in April, um, they're going to, they're, they, they have this long list of issues that they want to talk about in the code amendments. That's one of them. They uh, I don't know whether it's on tomorrow's agenda or yeah, I just the next think that's one. A that's a crux because it yeah it it limits the potential for someone to actually create that situation whereas a lot of people who may own a house has the potential for an ADU but won't do it mm. which doesn't help for housing you mm. know it, it limits the ability of an investor right to, to do something right yeah so um the the record is open um they're they're still accepting public comments just tell them that for me Kay. <laughs> um, so the board, the, if the board has any comments as a board, you, we can do, talk about that. Um, or if you want to make comments individually, you're, you're more than welcome to. What is the current off-street parking requirement for an ADU? We it says you have to have one. Retain off street parking requirements for ADUs, uh, which I believe is yeah, one. Yeah, we do have we do have it now, and. Um, the original recommendation from the project advisory group uh, was to remove the off-street parking and the owner occupancy requirements for ADUs. Um, but then when the when it went to planning commission, the planning commission decided to keep those two requirements, the off-street parking space and the owner occupancy. So now the city commission is going to consider both sides and see where they land. Yeah, I, I have fairly strong feelings about the off-street parking because in Kanema, at least, on-street parking is so scarce, yeah. so overloaded mm -hmm. that the last thing we want to encourage is more people needing to park on the street. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think if it's not possible or practical, for someone to provide off-street parking, then maybe tough. it's not practical to build the ADU. That's a tough one sometimes to get that off-street parking for an additional living space. I know. Yeah. I know. But just look at Kanema. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I try not to. I do like Kanema's not very well suited to... No transit and things of that yeah. it requires fire, fire engines and, uh, yeah just heart God, turns and, and, yeah. anyway that was my only mm -hmm. and that was and that was my only comment on it mm -hmm. and the only other thing i had was this is back to the um the policy you know the changes um on the municipal court code according to the is 
you've wiped out the entire thing for appeals. In that chapter. It's but it is covered within, okay, it's covered in chapter 1750, okay. so our appeal, oh, so it's redundant. Our appeal process is mm -hmm. described in 1750, you know, appeals okay. go to city commission. So it doesn't have to be yeah. on this one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then there was a line about a uh, secretary or something like that. Yeah. I'm struck that. I don't think, mm -hmm. <laughs> even when I was on the board way back when, uh -huh. I don't think we had a secretary. That's right. you guys. Right. And him. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. We have a video for that, a camera for that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Great. Um, so, we'll go ahead, Ken. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, jumping ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and jump. Okay. And I think we finished that. Part of the discussion. Okay. Um, uh, so HRP policies, we're back to that. Uh, we just had our open house. I think I'm going to guess 20 to 25 people. 25? Yeah. Wow. Over the two hours. Very cool. Um, uh, so I did not add anything additional to your agenda from what we had on the last agenda um, on this topic. Um, so if you, uh, if anybody wants to talk about anything specifically, I'm happy to do that. Um, but if there isn't any strong desire from anyone on the board, um, I did create a questionnaire slash survey form um, for people that came to the open house. Um, and I probably will post this online so that we can get some more input. Um, mm. So I think we only got a handful of them back. Um, but it, it does have some kind of pointed questions on fence and wall types. Um, so I thought maybe uh, this could be fodder for discussion today um, amongst you all. Uh, so I will pass down copies of this. Thank you. And I haven't, um, we haven't heard a whole lot of specific input about building materials um, from anyone. Um, I think a lot of the comments are focused on fences and walls. And so um, just want to give you a heads up that, you know, maybe our policies are fine, are mostly fine as they are. And that's why we're not really hearing a whole lot from people. Um, but we're We've trying. We've talked mostly about fences and walls. And that's consumed our time. And maybe it would be appropriate to start with the materials and then work back to the fences and wall discussion. That's fine too. Just, just because maybe, as you imply, it's a uh, short topic. Sure. Yeah. So um, wherever you want to start, but I, I have kind of pretty open-ended questions mm -hmm. about the building materials and solar panels, but then I, um, I felt it was important to get specific input on the fence types. Um, so there are some just questions that, like clarifications that I feel like we, I wanted to make and didn't want to leave it too open-ended. Well, the big challenge here is number one, the declining availability of quality wood products and the rising price of quality wood products. <clears throat> and the ever increasing availability or uh, selections available in substitutes for wood products. Now we had mentioned specifically the Fibrex windows and the fiberglass windows. And I'm not sure that a person standing and looking at them 
would <laughs> detect the difference. Fiber X, that's a, is that an Anderson window? It's Anderson. Mm -hmm. Trademark. It's a mm -hmm. composite. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I think that if we don't offer the public some flexibility to correspond with the changing reality, we run the risk of pricing people out of making improvements to their property. Um, The, the cost of, of wood that is of sufficient quality to last as decking material is just about the same as composite now. Yeah, a composite requires no maintenance and it lasts for a long time. I, I almost said forever, but I, I would know disagree with you on those two points okay. only because seeing it. Uh, composite is more expensive than wood. And in the Northwest, it, you know, it's plastic. Mm -hmm. It'll last, but in the Northwest, it's still cups, it still uh, flakes, it still oxidizes, and it still grows mold, mm -hmm. and it gets slippery. So it has all the same properties as wood, but costs more. But it's marketed so heavily to the consumer um, because it's a... But it's the, hey, put it in and you never have to do anything to right. it, right? You never have to clean it, but the reality is... You do. I've been on that stuff and I've fallen on it because of moss mm. growing on it. And if you've ever seen white PVC fence, after a couple of years, it turns green. Mm -hmm. um, so believe it or not, moss still grows on plastic and it still grows yeah. on that decking and people everything. do buy into <laughs> it. And we've put it in on for clients before, but they pay a lot more for it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so that's, that's okay. a, 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 a rebuttal to that, but, but I'm just one opinion, but people always, when you talk about it, they always go to, they want to want to do composite. That's why I'm kind of against it on older homes. It just may be in the back, but not in the front. That would be always my, my, my gig. Um, but on the other hand, fiberx or fiberglass windows, if I'm walking by them, I can't really tell the difference. But I can yeah. tell a uh, composite deck like that. Yeah, you, know? you can tell a vinyl window like that. Yes. Usually. But usually. it's pretty tough. I think you could tell a vinyl window really easily, but not so much a fiberglass window because it has the characteristics of a wood window. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that has the same reveals where vinyl right. doesn't in some cases. Right. So it's, we it's allow the fiberglass tomorrow. windows on new construction in the historic district. Yes. But not on not as a replacement for wood windows in a historic structure. Yeah, and for someone to build a house and, and they can still do wood windows, but it's so cost prohibitive. It's mm -hmm. very expensive. Yeah. And in the Northwest, um, again, it's wood windows worked really well in the old days because there was no insulation. Houses breathed, so it worked really well. Today, not so much. And fiberglass, out of all the products. Uh, shrinks and expands the least out of all the products today. So it's a great thing to have. Um, it's the best bang for your buck, although it's more money. But that's John's 10 cents. So what are your, um, where are you all leaning for these alternative window types um, as far as on saying? accessory structures? Uh, you know, you have a designated structure of someone's building a detached garage with a window in it or an, an ADU. Um, w would you be supportive of allowing those types of windows by right in those structures, um, in non-contributing structures in Kanema? I think it would be because if you had a house that you, you can't really replicate that window other than having it custom made, that that's probably okay. And most of the time when it's an accessory structure or a garage. It's at the back. They always had different things anyway in them. And they were less fancy and yes, yeah. You know. So I, I would have no problem knowing that, it, let's say, an ADU and, or a garage that you would require what you would require on new construction. But that's just me. I don't know. Everybody's got a different opinion. So. 
I think for accessory buildings, it's going to depend in my mind on, on the level of visibility. Mm -hmm. If it's, if it's high, highly visible, I think it's probably going to require a higher standard. If it's hidden out in the backyard, <sighs> we can cut some slack there. So maybe it's street facing. Unless they're on the corner, then what? <laughs> I'm on a corner. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm on the I, fence about it, but don't. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, April Fools was yesterday. Yes. Um. And non-contributing structures in Kanima. Uh, there's so many of those. Yeah. That's why I'm always like, why, why put standards on those things like those apartment buildings that have aluminum windows? Right. Well, they have vinyl windows now. Well, they might have vinyl, but it's like they upgraded. You have that blanket. It's like I can't. No, I don't believe in that. Yeah, the, I mean the difficulty is the policy says uh, in kind materials. Right. So yeah. if somebody has the aluminum or vinyl windows, we don't really want them to necessarily replace with in kind materials. So what kind of guidance? What other guidance can mm. we give them? Yeah, you yeah, have but, to have. But if you have a 70s duplex that's there, that's clearly from the 70s, you're not going to ask them to put historic windows in. Right. We addressed that a couple of years ago, probably just before you came back on the board for a fourplex in Kanema. Mm -hmm. Replacing the old original aluminum windows, and he asked to be allowed to put in vinyl, mm -hmm. and we approved it. Mm -hmm. I would have. I would have heard it. At least it's a step up. Yeah. 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 Aluminum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, that was an example of something that had to come to the board. They w would have been allowed by right, I guess, to build, to replace with aluminum um, because of the way the policy's written. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know. Well, aluminum's still done in commercial applications. Right. right. Um, well, I think you can't get it for homes that we considered the vinyl windows to be an upgrade mm -hmm. in the residential mm -hmm. for uh, over the original yeah. aluminum, <laughs> the original single pane aluminum, as a matter of fact, in that case. So something like that, do you think it's appropriate to still kind of take those as a case by case basis and have them come to the board? Or would you want to have try to write the policy uh, to address those kind of situations for the non-contributing, yeah, that could probably almost be an administrative thing, right? Well, right, if we have policy guidance, because I, um, I can only really make decisions that don't involve a lot of discretion, because it's a type it, it's what we call a type one decision, which doesn't have public notice, and it has to be pretty clear and objective. So we'd have to write the policy to give some clear and objective criteria uh, or guidance um, for if staff were to make the decision. So, because right now, if they have aluminum windows on, you know, non-contributing, that's all they'd have. Technically, to yeah. Do. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that it would. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Do you get a lot of... I haven't really. About windows, so I haven't. I mean... It, maybe it, then it's okay to leave it as it is and deal with it as we did mm -hmm. before. Just have them come to the board. Can yeah, even, because it was, it's not like we're being buried... No, that was a few years ago or whatever. If it's once every two or three years, then mm -hmm. that's probably not a big deal. Yeah. Well, it's not a big deal for for us. It might be a big deal for the property owner, but it's still, the fee is low. Um, it's just the time that it takes to get on the agenda and, um, you know, wait for the next hearing. Yeah, that's kind of a headache. So as much as possible, as much as we can, I think, um, it, it's beneficial to the 
you know, to the, these property owners out there to have the policy cover as much as we're comfortable it covering so that they can do the work, you know, in an efficient time frame. Yeah. True. That way, then I like the idea of <laughs> writing it down as, as long as we don't end up boxing ourselves in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a case where somebody asking to change from aluminum frame windows to vinyl windows where I would say, no, you can't do that. And can't think of a good reason why. Except in commercial applications, maybe. Yeah, I'm talking residential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice. <laughs> well, this is all very exciting. So. <laughs> <laughs> Snooze fest. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I can uh, take a stab at crafting something up for you guys to look at. Sure. Okay. okay. But it's not going to be, uh, it's probably going to have to look slightly complicated. It's going to have We're going to try and address lots of situations. Mm. It might not be like. Keep it simple, man. Try as good as I can. Hi. And then the question of the windows mm -hmm. for replacing wood windows. Whether it's whether it's contributing or non-contributing, would these renewal by Anderson or the the fiberglass or or Fibrex? be pretty sure they're acceptable on a non-contributing <clears throat> structure. Yeah. And I don't think we've ever allowed them on a contributing structure. Have we? The Andersons? I think Not that I know of. I mean the Fibrex or the fiberglass? Um, we may have allowed a fiberglass clad wood, window. wood yeah. on a historic structure. Yeah, yeah. But non-contributing is there, um, do we regulate that? If in they, Kinema. Oh, okay, but not in the McLaughlin. Right. Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay. And I don't actually know if I could see the difference. John is shaking his head and you know, I, I don't see the difference, but then yeah. I'm generally not looking. I do have um, I don't think you see it too a sample of a Fibrex, that little window over there mm -hmm. um, we had out at the open house. If you want to take a closer look at it and then I can dig out some somewhere. I have little swatches of aluminum and um, the fiberglass. The yeah. They're both white, but you can kind of compare what they look like. And so I can take that out if you'd like to look at those. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that. What I, what I haven't seen or don't know that I've seen it. Maybe I've seen it and just didn't know that what I was looking at. I think that's entirely mm -hmm. possible. Um, But if you can't tell by looking at it, it ought to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go away when you. I don't know what I hit. Yeah, I don't. Mine did that too, and I had to mouse click on that. Ah, oh, there it was. Got the magic touch. So that would require a uh, 
change in policy, mm-hmm. is there a compelling reason to do it, to, to change the policy? Is, is it a problem for people? Well, I mean, our next meeting, I'm going to be summarizing the public input for you. So we may have, you know, I haven't read the, the sheets that we got in today, but we may have some good input from folks about that. Okay. Um, I don't hear stuff like that all the time. Um, but I do know, you, you know, we've had some recent um, situations with final windows being, you know, put into a historic home because people moved in, they didn't know, or they say they didn't know. And um, and so if we had a policy that was maybe a little bit more flexible, it could potentially avoid some of those situations where people try to get away with mm-hmm. other materials. Um, but I, I don't hear, I, I don't hear a huge outcry right now for us to change our policies about windows. I, mean, I don't think to. we're going to. Okay. Um, so we can, want sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> <laughs> kind of feel that way mm-hmm. now. We can finish that discussion then after looking at the public yeah, and yeah. put it at our next session. Okay. And that leaves it leads us right back to walls and fences. Yes, yeah, so we I know any more than we used to. <laughs> so I think um, where I I want to make sure that the policy gives clear direction to property owners. Uh, so I think that there are um, some fences that are just not addressed in the policies. And if we could add them, if, if we think it's something that we can give clear direction on, um, then we should. Um, so the two, if we're looking at this pa- uh, packet, um, chicken wire and uh, goat fence, I, know, I don't know what else, people, how else people may refer to that, but um, neither of those are really addressed in the policies. Really? And we have a neighbor, I have a neighbor that has a goat fence. Yeah. So the the policies allow woven wire fences um, as acceptable in the front in front yards currently. Um, but I, I don't think that the woven wire is meant to cover either of these types. Um, so I think we could we could clarify it. Um, so we'll, see, you know, I, I, of course we're getting public input on this, and so we can mm-hmm. look at what, what we get. But if you, if you all want to react to any of this at any well, point, the chicken wire and goat wire, my reaction is <laughs> no. Um, what is the woven wire that's in there right now? Uh, what would that be like? It's. Uh, it's like that rolled, kind of curled stuff that's yeah. interwoven or something like that. Like it's a little bit more ornate. It's ornate. Yeah, it's a little bit more ornate. This is oh, okay. like Wait. Wait. I thought it was like a decorative. Yeah, this is like yeah. a hand. No, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's oh, different yeah, versions exactly. of that, but yeah, it's like a twirl. Yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah, of yeah. fancy. Yeah. It's been around for a long time. Long time. It feels like it's yeah. <laughs> we're we're getting, getting more well, noise. Suddenly it started that way. Yeah. I could hear you guys like louder. Maybe me too. Yeah. Maybe Isn't that weird? Maybe they got turned up. Hello. You're being too quiet. Maybe. <laughs> um, poured concrete also is not um, addressed in the policies. We do allow it uh, for new construction typically. There's walls in the districts that have, you know, their concrete with stucco on them or something. What about the design? You know, the design of the concrete makes a big difference. Yeah, I don't see. It's basically a real simple brick. Uh, so, brick, um, if, if the 
fence type was not really controversial, it, like it's already addressed in the policy and nobody's really questioning that or has a problem with it, then I like didn't put it in here. Like wood picket stuff. So yeah, wood picket, brick, oh, yeah, yeah. basalt. Sure. These are ones that are just on each side of the border. These are ones where I think we could add clarification or that, you know, I've gotten some comments in that um, dispute maybe our current policy. Do we differentiate at all between a uh, fence and a pen? A pen? Hmm? Like a chicken coop or something? Exactly. I don't think we mean to to regulate chicken coops. Good. But if they're using that as a fence, is that what you're well, well, if you as a, a barrier? Right, yeah, every now and then you'll see a dog <clears throat> is like a dog run built type. against the fence. In fact, fairly often you mm. see a fence being one side of the dog run. And what is acceptable for a fence between two properties may not include what mm. right. a dog run would be. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I think if it's being, if it's functioning as a fence, then it should, we should, then it should be. A yeah. Fence. Um, but if it is interior to the property where it's a chicken run or a raised bed or something like that, then we should, I, I don't think our, this is meant to regulate that. Okay, good. We don't regulate that. Right. 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 Um, on the, the next page, I think one of my, um, Made more major questions is this uh, vertical wood board. Uh, so, you know, we allow picket fences. I have a draft definition of it that defines the picket fence as spaced boards with that one to six inches of space between the pickets. Um, but we see a lot of, you know, fences with no spacing. Um, and we, you know, we see that we see people putting it in the front yard, um, which the policy does not currently allow. Um, but I would like to know if you see a big difference between spaced pickets and non-spaced pickets, and you know, should we just kind of allow any sort of vertical wood board fence in the front yard as long as it meets the height limit? There's a cup. There's one or two that have gone up in the McLaughlin um, on. On ninth that I can think of, and the one, I mean, it looks okay, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not objectionable, but, you know, it's mm -hmm. looking. So I think that could, I don't have a problem with it. I, the good neighbor fence, usually those are taller, though. Yeah. So those, and those would be on the front. Facade, right. but you, right. we, we allow them on the sides so or the, not? The side, um, I'll give you another board here. So the diagram of front corner and rear mm -hmm. is here. So right now, um, our policy Sorry, I'm not speaking into the microphone. Uh, right now, the policy does not uh, allow a good neighbor or unspaced wood vertical board fence in the front. Right. Only picket. Right, but on the space. sides? It, it, on the side and the rear, yes, that's permitted today. And does it go f f all the way up to the sidewalk, or does it have like a... Um, so if it's anywhere in front of the house, it's considered front yard. Front yard, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Whatever yeah. the house setback is, right. is where the where it can um, step up. Right. Correct. Yeah. So the, I mean, for, I mean, there are several fences out there where, if, um, you know, people have built kind of uh, like the picture on the left here, they've built fences kind of like that in their front yard, like on the side, like you're saying, Claire, but in front of the house mm -hmm. um, and it 
you know, to meet our policy, unless we change it, they would have to like remove every other board. Which, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that might be fine, but um, I think that's one of the major questions for me, because this is the, probably the biggest violation that we see is p people building fences like that in the front. Do you know right. why they build them? They don't Strong. know. <laughs> I have no idea. They just don't Maybe know. Maybe they the have small dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, because I have a picket fence and I've got like chicken wire on the, the very bottom so my yeah. dog can't get yeah. out. Um, and is this from the, looking from the outside, to me it should, I don't know, it just looks weird with the, um, with the post. I don't know if they just replaced it. With oh, a, the PT post? Yeah. Hmm. To me, it should have. To me, this looks like it's um, from looking from the back because I've seen these fences a lot of times, like the two by four on the top that's kind of sitting, you know, like this. Um, it, can it just be on the inside and have a more of a finished look on the outside? Do, do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, I think this one. This picture is on a side yard, and I think it's from Portland, not mm. from Oregon City. But um, the nice look, nicer looking part of the fence is uh, facing the property, and uh, that side of the fence is facing the neighbors. See, I think it should be the other way around. It should be nicer looking from you know the street, you know, because it gives it more of a finished look than. It's like wrapping a box. You put the pretty stuff on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you look at it. And you, you said that lots of people are building the... Well, I've seen, I've seen them around town, and we've had some code enforcement. Oh, yeah? When you see a law that is being commonly disobeyed or ignored, you or have they to didn't wonder know about the appropriateness of the law. Uh, so in other words, if everybody does it, it's okay? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... Well, yeah, I mean... Isn't that why pot is legal in this state? <laughs> that's, that's under, not under our purview. No, that's outside. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. I, I don't find the, the closely spaced boards offensive. <laughs> and the chat <clears throat> See, I don't have a problem with much of anything except for the um, the good neighbor one and the hedge slats and that gab gab gabion gabion wall. It's French. Yeah. And the steel aluminum. That's not. Yeah, great. gabion wall to me is is an industrial. Yeah. Retaining wall. And so Claire, you um, would you like to break out the good neighbor fence from this and have it treated separately, or consider it in the same category as vertical wood board? These two photos. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, except for the side yard. You know, I don't really think that that's a good one to have in the front yard. That's what I have. In your front yard? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. It was, there, no, it was there when I bought oh. the house. And I cut it down from six feet tall to three feet tall. Whoa. Yeah, I took a chainsaw to it. I don't have any problem with the recycling. Should we just go by each one and just kind sure. of give our, because well, we're kind of running out up. of time. We're out of time. Yeah. Yeah. We're out of yeah. time. Uh, but next time we'll have the input from the public. Yep. 
And why don't we set it as our goal then to uh, pin these things down? And Should make instead of starting <clears throat> at six, should we allow a little bit longer because just you know absorbing all of that and coming up with something um, or have a meeting an extra meeting or something to where we can just focus on it and, and spend two hours on it instead of piecemealing especially once you've gotten the um the feedback from the comment you know citizen mm -hmm. comments I don't know. I, I'm flexible. I can be here, but I don't know about other board members coming any earlier than six. That's tough. Okay. Yeah. Or just doing it on, a, you know, on another we night if we do it far enough ahead. No point in no. scheduling it. So. I know, like, we all need another meeting, but I just think if we spent a little, you know, I mean, an hour we really kind of, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm crunched in it, I think um, making changes like that, I think should have, we should spend a little bit more. You're talking just on fences. Fence, um, I guess primarily, but also, um, you know, maybe the windows or, I don't know, just. You can take You it. can get us the uh, input from the open house ahead of the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can have that to go over mm -hmm. at our Absorbed. meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we come in prepared next month mm -hmm. with, with that under okay. our belts, I, just, I think uh, we can actually it's the 23rd, roll, right? Steam yeah. roll it. I don't even know if I'll be in town. Uh, well, I should probably break. Yes. Let's adjourn the work session and return for the public meeting. Great.